Thank you very much. So, before I start, well, first of all, thank you. You wanted to see this talk more than the sharks, so that says a lot. It's amazing. But I have a confession to make. I never felt more of an imposter syndrome than before this talk, coming to the Netherlands to talk about optimization. There's a good reason for that. But if you are into conversion optimization, performance optimization, there's so many people from the Netherlands who are like top level, world class experts in those fields. And I was always wondering why. I, I never really understood why this is the country with the highest per capita number of optimizers. Until I came here yesterday, every corner of the land is so optimized. You have to take advantage of everything you have here so you can live. So, yes, it's in your blood, in the genes, in the water, whatever it is. But now I know. I'm going back home to Portugal and now I know why there are so many Dutch optimizers. Before we start, I want to know, like, if you're a developer, can you raise your hand, please, or write code, have chat to you write code for you, half, designers? Okay, the rest of you, okay, somebody screening, what do you do? Any optimizers? Marketing, okay, I'm going to forget that. Okay, but a lot of developers, this next slide, I really need you to go as hard as you can if you can do it triggers. Please, please do that. <laughs> okay? Okay, that's not bad. Don't wake up the animals. So, the reason I'm sharing this, I'm, I'm showing you this, it took trigger you to just be so upset and get you excited about the talk. But there's something like this in the world of conversion optimization as well, and that's the phrase CRO. Now, the first rule of optimization is don't call CRO because that is, that is the, the lower case peak of conversion optimization. There are two reasons for that. If you call it zero, it means you're only trying to improve conversion rate, one metric, and not care about anything else. It's very easy to hack conversion rate and make it higher. So if I told you I'm going to sell an apartment in Amsterdam for the price of from 2008, the conversion rate would be very, very high. But I would lose money, or you would lose money, because I, I tried it. The second reason is, if you're only focusing on conversion rate and nothing else, you're leaving so much on the table and so much things that you can do using these frameworks I'll show you today. Things like average order value that you're not working on, repeat purchase rate, uh, customer lifetime value. Optimization is about all of that and not just the conversion rate, not just about completing the checkout form. Is that at all more true? So, I will need some volunteers, I will, I will need participation from you during the presentation as we go through some frameworks that are very simple and very easy to use and a great way for you to study the conversion optimization. I hope you're willing to participate and not tired from, from the heat from the mangrove or wherever you walk. So I, I expect that to happen today. Now, what you can expect to learn today, I like to have key points every time I present anything, so optimization is that simple. It's really, really simple. Getting started is about as simple as anything else that you can do. But it's a lot of work that never ever ends. I'll show you the process a bit later. The second thing is, it is essentially a three-step process. There's research, prioritization, and then implementation. And implementation, like that, that's the last part. Every client will ask you, can we do some A-B tests? Like that's not the most that, That's the implementation. Don't do the first two, you will never be able to do A-B testing or any of that stuff. And uh, the famous Pareto principle, age money, absolutely applies here. I'll show you how in a later slide. But before I do, let me let me explain why I'm talking about this. Like, who am I to come to the Netherlands, the land of optimizers, and talk about optimization? So, as Dr. said, I've been working with WordPress for a very long time, since 2007. I am a human plugin author, both free and commercial. Uh, I was a member of the team review team at WordPress.org. Uh, core contributor, I think five times, small contribution, but they count, they, that's what they tell us. <laughs> and it's good for the CV. I used to, I was former lead developer of Connor Checkout plugin for WooCommerce. Uh, we released that together with Automatic and Connor. It was a huge project. And former CTO at Search Engine Journal. Uh, I was also a CXL certified commercial optimization expert. Currently, I am growth manager at Maximed and Region Premium uh, Certified <coughs> Expert Agency. Platinum, sorry, not even. Also, I hope the podcast that Dr. told you about. So check it out if you want to learn about website optimization. So, why am I talking about this today? This is the word entitled to talk, and that was horrible. I had to change it. I wanted to apply this to your great goals. Basically, 
how is Dr. Wine on platform users to start talking to you, to start and start talking to Now, Platform defaults are the one thing that annoys me the most about off the shelf solutions like WooCommerce, like Shopify, like anything else that, that you can use. The reason for that is the UX is basically done by someone else that you never knew, never will know. Yes, it gives you a great starting point, but also it gives you a lot of defaults that you will use without even thinking about it. That is very bad because you don't know if it was for users and you, you never think about it. So, throughout the talk, I will use an example of WooCommerce website that I will go through, analyze, dissect. And just use it as an example. The reason I'm using this website is because at WooCommerce blog, they use it as a proof that WooCommerce can scale. So it's a really like, large WooCommerce store. I'm not affiliated with it. I think it's a good website that could be better. So this is the website. And this is the thing, the thing I, I mean when I say platform defaults. So if you look at this, the Product category page. This is what almost every WooCommerce store looks like. So you come to the page and you want to see some products and they're sorted by default. That's what the user sees. What on earth is that? That doesn't make sense no matter how much you try to explain it. I mean, there's default sorting, there's also sort by latest. If I'm a user, I don't know what default is. I have no idea. Imagine going, you want to buy, let's say, a pair of running shoes, and you say, I run, that's my distance, that's my base, and then the, the, the guy from the store says, yeah, I got these pairs, they're sorted by default. Pick one. Like, what do you pick? You have no idea what that is. Sort by latest is slightly better, or less bad, but still, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the reason I chose this example is, when you're writing code, this makes a ton of sense to write like this. When you're using the website, sort by default is never going to make any sense, because Again, what is default? And this is a work engine, so I'm not allowed to talk bad things about WordPress without saying bad things about Shopify. Just <laughs> kidding. But to give another example, this is a product uh, page from Shopify store. I previous one was a water bottle website, so I chose the same category just you know, to compare, to give a fair comparison. Every product page in every Shopify store you can access using three different URLs. Unless you push to cluster, you do some redirects or whatever. Now, at least they do canonical. So those people, you, you know this better than I do. They do the canonical, so this is the only URL that Google will see. But depending on how your team developer adds links to what in the website, all three URLs can be accessed and they look the same. It's not a big deal unless you're someone like my colleague Luca who was given a task to set up heat map tracking on a product page on a Shopify store and then realize it's like a 30, one third split between three different URLs. So how can you do a heat map tracking on that? It, it just doesn't make sense. Or maybe it does, but you don't know if it, it makes sense for your store. That, that's kind of the whole point. The bottom line is how a website UX is made if you're using an off-the-shelf solution. Most likely, the UX, so that, that you know, which is the source of products, and a lot of examples like that. The UX, it's supposed to be UX design, was made by a developer. It was never met several years ago, and the developer never heard of the website. So imagine trying to hire a freelancer for some UX design work, and you're looking for a developer from five years ago who doesn't know you, and you don't, don't know that person, and you have a brief them over what to do. It's never going to work. So this is why the line is something written years ago by someone else that you never met is not a good idea. Luckily, luckily, it's a very simple process. Getting into optimization and starting to do optimization work is that simple. And I'll show you what that process looks like. So, there's three steps, and this is the broader principle, because the first step of research, the boring step, if you're a client, that that's just a waste of money, is going to take at least 80% of your time. So you need to do as much research as you possibly can and learn everything you can about the website you're trying to optimize. That's the first step. And then, when you do the research, which I will explain in more detail in later slides, you're going to work on prioritization of all the issues you found, so you know what to work on first and what to work on next. And then finally, in step three, which is the smallest step, there's implementation. That's the test, and that's the big synchronized what we did. So, let's have a look at the first step, research, because that is by far the most important one. If you have one takeaway from today, 
just know that optimization equals research. It's almost one to one ratio. If you do a lot of research, you will be able to optimize in a lot better way than if you're not doing any research at all. Or not enough research. So what that looks like, what the research looks like in conversion optimization. There are many ways to do conversion research, but one, one framework, or most frameworks rely on three different types of research at the same time. And you cannot skip research. You're going to have to do your research and a lot of research before you can optimize. So the first technique is quantitative analysis. The second is qualitative and heuristic evaluation is the third one. It doesn't have to be in order. The reason there's three different types of analysis is because let's say analytics tells you something's wrong on a page and then you're not going to fix, just blindly go and completely rewrite the page because what is the tracking is broken. So you're going to do user research as well. You're going to look at the page yourself and if it all matches, the issue is real and you're going to work. If not, maybe the tracking is off. So, what is quantity analysis? The first one. The, the, what, what it does is it tells you what happens and where which page that is on. So basically, you're going to look at your funnel, your, your landing, product detail page, card checkout, you're going to see where the drop off happens, where the people are dropping out of the funnel. You can look at any web analytics tool, including Gmail, or which people see the page these days. You can see that. You can, you can really understand what's happening. And you're going to look at different segments, so maybe, you know, maybe uh, BBC traffic drops off from car to checkout because the ad said free shipping and in the car in the car they see your shipping, of course people are going to drop off. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is it's going to tell you what are the what the most visited pages are and the landing pages are. And you do that using different web analytics tool, G4 of course. Uh, you look at heat maps, mouse tracking, or anywhere where you're, you're working with raw numbers. You need that kind of chart represented in a heat map or, or any other kind of chart. This is basically the career of a web analyst, but to do conversion optimization, you need to know a bit of this as well. Uh, the second one is qualitative analysis, and this is if, if the first one told you what happens, where it happens, this one will tell you why it happened and how it happened. And you do qualitative analysis by doing user testing, real user testing, we talk to them, tell them what to do, watch them, if they struggle, listen to their feedback. You can do session recordings, of course, as well. And then you can do surveys, customer support data. So anything where the raw data you're working with is not numerical, like in the first one. And just one tip about user testing, they're so easy. Just find a person who doesn't know your website, what you're working on, and tell them, I want you to get this task done. And can you watch it? Can you talk out loud what happens when you're trying to do it? It's that simple. If you do three to five tests a month, you're going to be practically back, uh, bug free when it comes to conversions. So it's three to five tests a month that you need to do, no more than that. And that's a few hours of work at most. Now, the third one, the most interesting one today, for this presentation at least, and I think the most interesting one for, for most people getting into optimization is the heuristic evaluation. Now, that is basically the expert evaluation of a page, it's a method for identifying different problems with the UI of the page. And I really think was what I said here, that this is the gateway drug to conversion optimization for most people that I talk. This is how they manage it. You, know, you start looking at a page a different way. You, you try, you start looking for problems. Like why is this logical? Why doesn't this work the way I expect? So it's not best practices, but this is as opposite as the best practices as possible. This is the best practices was, and trust me, bro, this is gonna work I saw it on Amazon. Heuristic evaluation is aimed at Trying to make, trying to help you understand why something works or doesn't work. So you're, you're starting with the why then, versus just copying with someone else. Then. So you should do this often. You should check your key pages, landing pages, check your website, or have someone else do it for you. Now, there's a framework that is very popular for heuristic evaluation that has a horrible name. It's an acronym. It's actually a, a landing page influence function for test. So some, somehow that's lift. So it's a lift model. This is this is very this is going to help you uh, get started with conversion optimization. This this exact framework. So what what this does is a framework for analyzing web and mobile experiences in developing testing hypotheses. You look at six different factors in the page and you analyze all six. Are they present? Is there too much of them? Not enough. So uh, it was developed in 2009 by Chris Goward 
founder of Wild Wild Agency, Courage Agency, sorry. And uh, you look at six different conversion factors and how they how they represent the page. So is the main conversion driver you see value proposition. So is the value proposition for what the page is trying to sell there? Is it strong enough? Is it communicated well enough? All that. And then you have three conversion boosters in relevance, clarity, and urgency. So is the page relevant for what the user is expecting to see? They click an ad for shoes and now they see a skirt, that's not relevant at all. Of course, they're not going to buy that. Then, is the information communicated in a clear way? Is there a sense of urgency that is trying to, that you trigger in the user to make him buy now? Or do they already have a sense of urgency? So let's say it's just for Christmas and you didn't buy the gifts and you can only do it online in one shop, no matter what the price is, you're going to sell that. So that, that's, that's called internal urgency versus external that you are trying to trigger in user. And there are two conversion inhibitors as well, so distraction and anxiety. The more distracted a page is, like if there are seven calls to action and you only need one and seven different calls to action, of course the user is going to be lost and distracted. And then anxiety, you know, if, if you don't have an about page or any information about the company, I'm anxious, I don't want to give money, I don't want to, money, I don't want to give my credit card. Who knows what you're going to do with that? So, now that you know these six factors, I want to share that same website that I showed you earlier, the, the water bottle website, and maybe we can maybe we can do it together. And maybe we can have a look at the page, the product we should do with model analysis, five minutes at most. So, the first thing you want to do, you're going to have to look at the web, the web page the way you use the web page. So this is wrong now. This is very, very wrong, because most users actually are going to look at the web page like this. So, if you're trying to understand the users, you have to really be in the truth. You have to... This is not only a small screen, but there's distractions around it, so it's even worse. But anyway, you can't, you can't distract yourself from the work. I mean, you can't, everyone does, but you know what you're to do. So you're going to take your phone, or at least, you know, small viewport on your computer, and you're going to look at the page that way. And that will look like this. So this is about the fold, first uh, scroll, and I have another screen, and a slide with two more. Well, let's have a look at what happens in this page. I'll start and then you can do the next slide. You can help me do the next slide, please. So, the first thing I see, the shipping. <coughs> I loaded this page from Portugal. So why am I seeing the information that the shipping is free for us? Why, why are they showing me that? Why are they not using that space to do something smart? Maybe you have a campaign send you to the right website, at least. If that's not the one where I should. So to me, that's, that's distraction. That, that, the, the distraction is there, it's going to, it's not going to help the conversion, it's going to harm the chance that I buy this uh, The second, uh, there's, I mean, there's a good one, the sense of urgency, because this is on sale, that's a good thing, this is supposed to help the conversion, but it could be better, because it's early September, why don't tell me back to school this month or something like that, or call it that so I know it's going to disappear in two days, it's going to be on a discount for just a few days or a week or something like that. So there's some sense of urgency, some higher sense of urgency actually than there is now. Looking at the right one, I think there's a lot of distraction here with these swatches. On my phone, on everyone's phone, they're so small that you cannot really tell which animal it is. You can just see the color and then you have to like change it, see the big one change, and then you have to look at all of these one, two, three, fifty. I think 15 different swatches can pick the one that you want. So maybe it's going to be a drop down list that has a name. If they have the test from Messi, they just have a name so I know which animal I can expect and tell me what the color is or something like that. Because this way, the only way for me to see what the bottom looks like is to really open all of these and then forget which one I like and then go back and try to find it again. And that's a very distracting experience. So, if you don't mind, I would really like you to try to help me with. <laughs> can you find any of these six factors? You can see them. Value proposition, relevance, clarity, urgency, and line of trash. So, do you see anything, anything that matches the UDs, the page? I'll give you a minute to think. Very sad. A lot of what? Distraction, yeah. I mean, you add to cart everywhere, yes, definitely. I'll give you one that gives me anxiety. Uh, yeah, I'll give you two that give me anxiety. 
So they're saying these two are frequently bought together. So this is a cap that you have in this bottle, and there's a cap sold separately, and they're telling me most people buy another cap. So does that mean that the bottle comes without a cap? Do they need to buy it separately? And now I don't know. It doesn't say anywhere the patient comes with a cap. But it says that they're lying, obviously, because people don't buy it together. It's just put it together so to try to increase average order value. If they say people usually buy a bottle, like who has kids here? When you buy a water bottle, do you buy another cap? <laughs> no. no one does, right? So they either are wrong or the bottle comes without a cap. I, I, don't, I don't know which one it is. The second one, the price for both, there's no discount there. So it costs more than adding two together. Yes. So how does that make sense? It makes me anxious again. Like, do they know what they're doing? Again, no art feelings now being great products. <coughs> Another one that causes me anxiety is bottle made in the USA, all that local goods, local jobs, your emissions, can't pay in China. <laughs> <laughs> Just shut themselves in the foot right there. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So, <laughs> American Eagle, right? <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so when you're done, when you're presenting this to a client, it's going to look something like this. You're just going to mark all these on the page and you're going to say, yeah, this is, there's a clear sense of urgency where we're triggering it here, so that's a good thing. The value proposition, I didn't really find it in the page, so let's say it's simple, safe, sustainable. There's no better one. The breadcrumbs are a distraction because they say I'm categorized. I don't know why it's there. But, I mean, they should do those problems, right? Spaces. And then this up at the top is distracting. This is distracting. It's not clear at all to the small swatches. There's some value proposition in the description, but it's pretty bad. Uh, the, the, the reviews. I don't think, I don't know if they didn't load for me properly, but they show these five empty, so there's no reviews for this product. Why show me that there's like five empty stars or whatever this is when there's no reviews? Just say, why are you? And then looking at the next one, this would make me anxious. Uh, there's no clarity of frequency bought together like when you're recommending add-on products or you know, cross sets. You have to tell me why. Like, you can't just say frequently bought together because I know workers, like that's the default. I know WooCommerce. You haven't done anything. I'm not going to buy it. And then uh, the kids OTF, if that's the long description. Yeah. I can find it here, it's on the fly. Am I supposed to know what OTF means? That's very unclear. And then, this could be relevant, this dishwasher safe, BPA, BPS free. Someone would care about that, but I honestly don't know what BPA and BPS stand, but what the acronyms are. So maybe explain why it's important to you don't have that. I know they're bad. I know that much. And then China. So, I think that's strange. I think that's really, really strange. That they, 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 they're small pieces of this that are left out. But anyway, it's a good page overall. Every page has a proof and proof. That, that's kind of the whole thing. So when you're done with this and the quality and the quantity, you find a lot of issues that need to be worked on in the page. You don't just do unordered this big one and work on it. No, you need to try on this. There's frameworks for that as well. And there, there are some that are that simple. The only problem with prioritization frameworks is they tend to be subjective. So you're creating your own work and how you feel something will be, but it's better than nothing. So one, very popular. Did I get the right pie? <coughs> yeah? Okay, it's called the pie framework. And it's called pie because there's three factors to creating the, the issue for. The first one is potential, how much the issue can be improved. So if something is, let's say, objective is broken, like zero percent that it works, yeah, the improvement can be huge because it's completely blocking room and just by fixing it, you're going to make, you're going to do a lot of good work. So the second one is importance. Like how important is this issue to fix it? So if you have like a lead gen form on some page that no one ever sees and it doesn't work, who cares? Like that's zero. You just remove it. And then the ease. The third one is ease based on Technical availability of your developers, dev resources, it's a political issue within the company, you know, there's a term hippo, maybe the, the, the what was it? What is that for? You know, you know. High state person's opinion, something like that. So yeah. Maybe there's a hippo that doesn't want something to be changed. 
and getting them to test it would be difficult. So you rate everyone and you get something like this. You have a spreadsheet and take it enough to as an example. The page in template where it appears, it's site wide, the potential for improvement. I think it's high because let's say you can push campaigns there, you can show them some useful information rather than you know, there's free shipping in the country on the end, which is just not alright. The importance, I think, is not to fix something like this because everyone sees this page and giving the right information to everyone who sees your website is important. The ease, if you know what to put there, is 10, so the pi score would be average of those to 0 0.9. You do that for all these, and once you are done, you have a, basically a, a list, an ordered list of things that you need to work on. So in this case, the first issues that we work on would be Product description is too technical. This is for a parent who just wants to see something cute about their children and how they help the children. It's too technical the way it is, so I will work on that because it's easy to do. And then the, the site wide announcement bar is another one that I will start with. And then you go to the, the one that's eight, the color options, and so on and so on. So, once you're done with that, you, have, you, you did all the issues, you know which ones to work on first. We have a list of things to work on. What are you going to do with them? There are several different things you can do. And if something is broken, it just doesn't work. You don't have to test it. If fixing it helps, you just fix it. So that's the easy one. If there's something that you know, trying this other option versus option A, you're just going to test right away. There's no need to write a box or anything like that. You're just going to test. But sometimes you can't simply test because you don't know what the test is going to be. So you need to develop a test. You need to write a good hypothesis for that test. And a good hypothesis for an A-B test is basically saying something like, we believe that if we do this, we will make this outcome happen, and we will know if it happened when this happens. So when, when this metric comes from 10%, 20%, whatever, whatever you choose. And sometimes you're going to need to do more research. Uh, and uh, that could be more uh, analytics implementation, that could be more user testing, you talk to more users, whatever it is. But sometimes you're just going to go back to the drawing board and do some more work. So, uh, to recap, to recap this technique, it, the, the process, not technique. Optimization is a never ending tree safe process. Don't let this scare you because it's actually fun, it's actually easy to get started, and I think that we should. You will spend at least 80% of your time doing research, user research, web analytics, heuristic evaluation, everything else, because the key to becoming an optimizer is to understand what is happening and why it's happening, and why the thing you want is not happening. That is the most important thing. It will take years or decades to become Dutch level expert at optimization, but getting started and being able to do enough damage is super easy and I strongly encourage everyone to go back to the list model I shared and just apply it to a patient to get one. It could be a landing page, it could be an e-commerce product page, whatever it is, your client works to your own website. Just look at it with, with, with different settings. <coughs> and uh, again, thinking the way the users think, that is absolutely essential, that is the key, that is something that, that you must do because as one guest in the podcast, uh, John McDonald from the good uh, conversation is that you can't read the label from inside the chart. And, and it's simple, but it's, it's just true. You, if you look at it from WP admin, if you look at it from your code, if you look at it, you don't see it the way any user ever would. So you have to really ignore everything you learn, and the list model actually helps you with that, and try to look at your website in a different way. And A-B testing, and the first thing you have a meeting with a client, any client about optimization, they will ask you, can we test this? You want to tell them, no, we have to do a lot more work before we start testing. It's a tiny piece of the puzzle. It's very interesting, yes. I think now that Google Optimize is dying. Like in 20 days, they're killing Google Optimize, so there's not going to be any free A-B testing tools for users who don't need A-B testing to work with and assess it. I think it's going to be less of a factor. It's important still, of course it is. But I, I, I think, uh, it's not as important as, as most people believe it is. So that's that. Lift model, remember the lift model, remember the research, 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 and, and you'll be good. You'll do much better than, than most people do. So I have, let's go with questions first and then we can do the, the, the run -up. 
If anyone wants to connect this in my LinkedIn, please do. So, yes. Uh, first, before we go to questions, a big round of applause, please.